Uh, this is the fourth uh, event under the SIPA series. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, we have started doing a deep dive into the various sectors, which are going to be huge beneficiaries of SIPA. And then uh, we have an expert panel, both here and from India, thanks to our partnership with the Trade Promotion Council of India, TPCI. And they are waiting there in the wings. Literally, I can see them uh, connected to us. So I think uh, SIPA was a huge building block that was negotiated in a record time of 88 days. Uh, sorry, 88 pages and 80 days, as it were. And uh, that building block, uh, the first building block, of course, was when the Indian Prime Minister visited in 2015 and signed a partnership agreement on the investment side. And since then, the relationship has been growing from strength to strength. There was a historical relationship prior to that. Uh, there was uh, a relationship in terms of... Uh, connectivity, people to people. But I think on the economic front, uh, these two measures, both the investment partnership agreement earlier and SIPA have been huge building blocks. And SIPA is only as good as SIPA, what SIPA does, i.e. Uh, the trade and industry take the opportunity uh, that is uh, open to them, the highway that is possible now, the connectivity between the UAE and India and make sure that each of these sectors uh, benefit significantly, both in both countries, both in the home country and the host country, as it were, for us and for our uh, counterparts in India. I think in that context, uh, I'm glad that uh, we have some veterans uh, from both ends uh, on the panel discussion. So rather than stealing their thunder, uh, let me conclude by saying that IBPC is ready and willing, and in fact, uh, would be able to also assist our friends from India that want to set up businesses here, uh, reach out uh, to worthy counterparts, make sure that the services that they need are also arranged with eminent, reliable, credible partners here, and make sure that uh, there are some tangible solutions that come out of endeavors such as these uh, efforts, such as these to connect the two geographies. So thank you very much. And I look forward to an engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I request Honorable Council General of India, Dr. Amanpuri to address the audience, please. Thank you so much, Chairman of IBPC, Sri Suresh Kumarji, uh, distinguished panelists sitting here at the Consulate of India in Dubai, and of course, our uh, esteemed panelists joining us virtually from India. I'm really delighted that we are continuing this series on the dialogue and the conversation on the outcomes of SIPA, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement because both governments are very keen to understand from the industry, from the specialists and the experts, what are the opportunities and the challenges going forward. We fully understand and appreciate there would be certain challenges uh, which the businesses will face. And we are very keen to learn about them, get a genuine feedback from the ground and to make sure that those policy changes can be made. You're all fully aware that UA India Corridor in the health and wellness sector is a very critical one, very, very important sector. Uh, in the UAE, we have several healthcare providers, uh, Indian entrepreneurs, Indian physicians turned entrepreneurs, and there are amazing success stories here. Several of them are sitting in the room here. We have also seen that UAE has been able to attract some of the best brands in healthcare from across the globe including brands like Cleveland Clinic. Uh, when it was set up, uh, the Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi, that was the first uh, center outside North America of this brand, which is arguably one of the world's uh, top brands. 
when it comes to cardiac care, when it comes to uh, healthcare delivery in several other important uh, areas of healthcare delivery. We have seen that, you know, the CIPA has created immense opportunities for the pharma sector. India, as all of you are aware, is known as the pharmacy of the world, makes huge contribution uh, to, you know, manufacture. We have 10,000 plus manufacturing facilities. We have amazing human talent in this field. Uh, we are ob obviously outside the US, we have the largest uh, FDA approved plants. But what we have not seen is the Indian manufacturers using UAE as a manufacturing base uh, to make their global expansion, literally. Because what UAE provides is not just access to the UAE market, but to this entire region, the Middle East, North Africa, and beyond. The UAE government is very keen to increase the contribution of manufacturing to the GDP. UAE government is extremely keen to create security in this sector uh, after the unprecedented healthcare crisis which the world has faced, and that creates a huge opportunity. We feel there is immense scope for Indian pharma majors to look at UAE as a base to do manufacturing, uh, to set up R&D facilities, and to make use of the strategic location of the UAE, of the global talent which is available here, of the investable surplus which is available with the Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Funds. So I think UAE and India are natural partners, and together we can go to the next level. We understand that 2022 brings UAE and India at a historic inflection point. And it is also very true for the healthcare and wellness sector. And we would like to see joint projects where both economies, they contribute jointly and address global challenges. And I think we have to think big. We have to make, uh, make use of the available opportunity. Both the governments have negotiated the SIPA on behalf of the sector, on behalf of the specialists, on behalf of the healthcare providers, the pharma industry, the medical devices industry on both sides. And I think it's important now for the businesses to take full advantage of this uh, framework which has been created, this pathway. And of course, we have already seen a large amount of investment going from the UAE into India in the healthcare sector. Several of the healthcare providers here in UAE uh, of Indian origin, they have invested back in India and they have in that process also brought some uh, globally best practices to India. And we are extremely you know, appreciative of, of that contribution, of that investment, and of course, of bringing the ideas. All of you might have noticed one interesting development which has happened in 2022. Now you're seeing several funds being launched here, which are dedicated specifically to Indian startups. Just a couple of days ago, I saw uh, the setup of another fund. So, I mean, I can name there are 10 plus funds which are looking at Indian startups. And of course, healthcare is a very important segment. So, what is important? Uh, for all of you is to identify the opportunities in the UAE, identify those Indian startups who could actually add value here. And in that process, they would also uh, be able to kind of catalyze and fast track their global expansion. And I think that's a, that's a huge area of opportunity. Together, UAE and India can partner and co-create the innovation in the healthcare, which is very much required. And that opportunity must not be lost. Of course, I would also like to mention that the Dubai Industrial Strategy 2030 and Abu Dhabi Vision 2030 both aim to increase investment in human capital, investment in uh, manufacturing capabilities, investment in R&D. And in this sector, there are huge opportunities for the Indian uh, companies and startups and innovators and healthcare providers to come and uh, provide those services here. Just to let you know that we have been always emphasizing a lot on this sector. In 2020, when the world was going through this crisis, we organized the UAE India Healthcare Summit, which brought some uh, healthcare leaders uh, from both the economies together to discuss ways and means of collaborating and partnering. Last year, 
uh, we had hosted the India Global Forum uh, on the 12th and 13th of December, where we had the Honorable Minister of Health uh, and Family Welfare from India, Shri Mansukh Mandavia ji. He was here. He interacted with his uh, UAE counterpart. He, of course, interacted with the healthcare providers here. We organized a specific session for him uh, to get feedback from the UAE-based uh, Indian entrepreneurs in this sector. And that was a very, very useful, very useful discussion. I must say that, uh, you know, that discussion is being taken forward. UAE and India are jointly going to be setting up uh, healthcare delivery platforms, services, hospitals in Africa, for which a special delegation uh, had been organized, in which our Joint Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Shri Lava Garwalji, was also there. We had representation from CAF Holdings. Uh, Dr. Ravi is here. He was there, part of the delegation. We had uh, representation from Indian healthcare providers. We had representation for from G42, from Tamu Healthcare, from Pure Health. So that is the kind of you know engagement we are looking at, and that those projects will be supported by both governments, and we would be depending a lot on Indian professionals, on our Indian. Uh, uh, workforce which is absolutely providing a stellar job and you know making huge contribution to healthcare globally you know uh, before coming to dubai i used to serve in the united kingdom there i was told that one out of five physicians and one out of four dentists in the uk is of indian origin so that is the kind of contribution which indian healthcare professionals are making to this sector in different parts of the globe and just i'm giving you one small example UAE is no different. UAE has a huge uh, footprint of the Indian entrepreneurs and physicians and other healthcare uh, professionals, whether it is from the nursing, whether it is the paramedics. And we are extremely proud of the work they've been doing. And we need to take it to the next level now. Uh, with these words, I'd like to once again thank IBPC for organizing this very important session. And I would like you to please be mindful of these huge opportunities, huge investable surplus, which is now, you know, looking at projects in India, it is looking at joint projects in the UAE. And I think we should now fast track our journey and take things to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, sir. May I now request the Associate Professor Center for WTO Studies, IIFT, and member committee of for advanced trade research in trade promotion council of india dr pralok gupta for his address dr pralok gupta is joining us from virtually sir over to you thank you uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the organizers uh, for having this very uh, timely and opportunate webinar on a very important topic uh, and also greet uh, uh, Chairman IGPC Excellency Dr. Manpuri, distinguished panelist, uh, uh, participants, uh, and other uh, others who have joined for this webinar. We all know the importance of health, particularly after the post-pandemic in the post-pandemic period. That how much importance important it is to um, have health, good health facilities, whether it is uh, health products or health services, and this is an area where. Trade can play an important role. It is a win-win situation. Unlike other sectors where when we are having trade or exports and imports, then the exporters or of other countries are benefited and importing country uh, has some concern whether uh, it is good or not. Health, is, health sector is one sector where if you are importing good products or good services, then it is benefiting your own population and which will ultimately increase their efficiency, their happiness uh, and many other things. So it is a win-win situation for the exporting country as well as for importing country. So from this perspective, uh, when both UAE government and Indian government uh, negotiated this uh, SEPA, so there are provisions pertaining to health services, health products in this agreement. And they are very important. They are trying to uh, materialize the opportunities, the complementarities that both the economies are having. So in the good sector, if we talk about, uh, there are provisions pertaining to pharmaceutical products. So, so there is a bilateral cooperation agreement on pharmaceutical products. 
So essentially, this bilateral cooperation agreement is saying that uh, the pharmaceutical products of each country can be recognized in their country based on their domestic standards if related standards are not available. Also, uh, in terms of marketing use authorization, there is a fast track process. So if certain pharmaceutical products are authorized in specific developed countries, America, uh, UK, Europe, uh, Australia, Canada, then based on that authorization, the fast track authorization can be given within 30 days. As compared to the normal authorization, which takes around nine months to 70 days. So just within one month, the authorization could be given. So this is a very important aspect of promoting health products, uh, pharma products trade between the two countries. Coming to the services part, even for the services, healthcare services, which is like your medical services, dental services, nursing services, hospital services, there also both countries have taken significant commitments. So uh, UAE has taken commitments to allow 100% FDI in hospital uh, services subject to some economic need test, 70% in medical and dental services, 49% in nursing services. Similarly, India has also taken 100% FDI commitment in hospital services, uh, nursing services, medical and dental services, subject to bringing latest technology. So that means the service provider from each country, they can go and set up their uh, healthcare services uh, uh, facilities in the other country and then provide these countries. There are also provision for the mutual recognition of qualification. In the health services, this is a very important aspect because ultimately if the qualification of say a doctor or a nurse is not recognized in another country, then he or she cannot practice in that country. So from that perspective, there are provisions to recognize the qualification of healthcare professional in each other country. Uh, in the medical and dental field, in the nursing services. And uh, regulatory bodies in these fields are encouraged to sign the MRAs as soon as possible as per this agreement. So this agreement tries to capture the elements of both services as well as the healthcare products in order to promote trade in healthcare uh, sector between both the countries. However, there are a few challenges also. Let me highlight that also because otherwise the discussion uh, may not be complete. And one is, of course, uh, related with this MRA, which I was just telling, because MRA as mutual recognition, mutual recognition agreements are the most difficult part to sign because each regulatory body has its own mandate uh, independence. So they take time. So to the extent that MRAs are not signed in a reasonable time as early as possible, they will a kind of may become potentially challenge or potentially problematic for the movement of professional between the two countries. The second is, uh, which is very important from the telemedicine uh, perspective and more and more trade is happening through cross-border mechanisms where patients are sitting in one country, doctor in some other country or telediagnostic, those sort of things, the data regulations, data protection regulations. Uh, many of you may be aware that India, uh, government of India, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, just a couple of days back released the digital personal data protection bill. And it has provisions for the cross-border data flow transfer of data from India to some other country. It is just in the uh, draft bill and open for public consultation. And the final will be depend upon how it is passed in the parliament. Similarly, UAE also has its data protection laws. In fact, it is also having a specific data protection law for the healthcare se sector, which is in the federal law uh, number two of 2019. And there are provisions, uh, UAE also, this data protection law was passed very recently. I mean, these were applied very recently or in January, 2022. So the point is that there is a data protection law in UAE, there is a data protection law, which is in making India also. But depending upon how much is the compatibility between these two data protection laws, the transfer of healthcare data between the two jurisdiction will be determined. So that could also be an issue which the service providers uh, who are having uh, teleco this uh, data in healthcare services, telemedicine, telediagnostics, they may face difficulty if adequate data protection of the similarity between the two legislations are not there. But nonetheless, in spite of a few challenges, uh, this agreement is uh, certainly a very kind of milestone and a welcome step to realize the trade potential and the complementarities between these two economies. And I'm sure that uh, in coming years, there will be 
uh, a significant increase uh, in trade in healthcare products and services between these two countries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. Now, to begin with the discussion, I would like to introduce the moderators. So we have we are joining by uh, Sri Virat Bahari ji as deputy. He is the deputy director for uh, Trade Promotion Council of India. He will be moderating the session uh, virtually for India panelists. And we have Dr. Sajid Burud with us, managing and medical director for Ishak bin Umran. Dr. Sajid, may I please have you? to the table and introduce uh, the panelist, followed by Viratji to introduce the panelist based in India. Thank you, sir. Right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, anyway, thank you for inviting us. And it's a pleasure. And it's great to understand that healthcare sector has give, been given a get, great importance, especially healthcare services, especially what we have seen in the last two years during Corona and the pandemic. Uh, without wasting time, uh, our we have three distinguished panelists from the UAE, and uh, the first one is Dr. Ravi Parihar. He is the head of clinical operations and marketing, MENA region for Kef Healthcare. He's been an orthopedic surgeon with an experience of over 26 years, and with this great uh, experience, he is responsible for planning, organizing, coordinating, and directing all medical ac activities under Kef Healthcare. Now, KEF Healthcare is part of KEF Holdings, which is a family, privately owned family company. It's established over the last 25 years back in UAE. Uh, KEF uh, Healthcare has established multiple uh, hospitals, one in uh, Kerala, which is a 220 bed hospital, and then has partnered with multiple hospitals around in UAE also. KEF Healthcare is starting up one of the largest wellness center in Kerala, and uh, it will be the largest in India. And then expand to multiple around all across the globe. Uh, this wellness health care center will be will have an integration of modern medicine and with an alternative medicine to bring about a new approach to wellness sector. So Dr. Ravi Paraha, my second panelist is Dr. Malti. She is well known. She is a group chief medical officer and director for and chief quality officer for Aster DM Healthcare around India and GCC. She has over 20 years of experience as medical and quality director across major corporate hospitals. For Aster DM, she is a key contributor to conceptualize, design and drive implementation of Aster DM healthcare vision and strategy for excellence in clinical and non-clinical quality systems. She is also uh, in, uh, in she is also important in implementing the process to ensure patient safety and satisfaction all across all business verticals of the hospitals, medical centers, pharmacies across India and GCC. Welcome, Dr. Malti. Our third panelist is doc Dr. Sanjay Patankar. He is a well-known entity in UAE. As we all know, he is a pioneer in creating affordable healthcare model in UAE. He's moved to UAE in, since 1988 and then started his first clinic in 1993. This goes way back. And then he's grown from his first clinic to multiple clinics, pharmacies, and diagnostic centers across the UAE. He's the founder and managing director of Right Health Group in UAE. He has also received multiple awards for his contribution to the community work he has done. As Right Health Group, he has it is a group which is most prominent for value healthcare organizations in UAE, offering expert primary healthcare services to workforces, ensuring that the healthcare is accessible to all without discrimination. They have multiple of more than 30 clinics, 20, 30 pharmacies, diagnostic centers, serving around 2,500 patients daily. Welcome, Dr. Sanjay Padankar. Thank you. Now I request our moderator from India, Virat Bhari ji, to introduce the panelist uh, online and uh, we'll take it forward from here. Virat ji, over to you. Thank you so much, Shishir. Uh, greetings, Dr. Aman Puri sir, uh, Suresh Kumar sir, Dr. Palok Gupta sir, uh, and uh, Dr. Sajid Bharat, uh, who's my co-moderator from uh, UAE. 
uh, esteemed panelists and uh, friends from both sides. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure for me to represent TPCI on this highly topical and relevant panel discussion on healthcare opportunities and challenges between India and UAE post SIPA. Healthcare is undoubtedly a very critical sector across borders in the present day and age. The past few years have especially taught us the importance of maintaining robust and responsive healthcare infrastructure backed by best medical, pra medical practices and technology. India is recognized as a leading destination for healthcare services with a number of state-of-the-art healthcare facilities with demonstrated capability for simple to complex medical procedures and excellent post-operative care at highly economical prices. Apart from this, India has distinct advantages with Ayush and wellness therapies and a growing uh, footprint in digital healthcare. Uh, the health and uh, wellness sector has obviously got huge potential and scalability to grow its share in India's services exports. To quote just one data point, uh, India is projected to create 1 million health professionals every year, which can be juxtaposed with a projected global shortage of 12.9 million professionals by 2035. So this hybrid event on India UAE uh, potential in healthcare services uh, organized by TPCI and IPPC Dubai with the support of the Consulate General of India Dubai involves panelists from wellness, affordable healthcare, hospitals, medical centers, and medical equipment to discuss potential of trade in these sectors, challenges, and solutions. I will now proceed to introduce the panelists from the Indian side. Uh, we have with us Dr. Suchita Martin, a scientist E mission in charge and member secretary, medical device and diagnostics mission secretariat. Secretariat, Indian Council of Medical Research, Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Dr. Markin is a doctorate from PGIMER, Chandigarh, and Executive General Management from IM Lucknow. She's working as Scientist E at ICMR headquarters and provides IP and techno legal advisory support to all 27 ICMR institutes across India. She's also responsible for leading a new mission mode national level initiatives, uh, uh, initiatives in the Medical Device and Diagnostics Center as the mission in charge for uh, medical devices and diagnostics. She has a rich experience of over a decade and a half in drafting, providing policy advisory in medical devices, IP management, tech transfer, entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship development, strategic collaborations, including inter-institutional, industry academia, industry academia, government partnerships in healthcare. And she's an expert member of a number of national and institution, institutional committees on medical devices development, IP policy, tech transfer and commercialization with numerous international publications to her credit. Next, we have Dr. Upasna Arora, Director, Yashoda Super Specialty Hospitals. She is a dynamic leader in the Indian healthcare industry and has been the director of Yashoda Hospital since 2000. She's the first Indian working in India to be awarded the prestigious fellowship of ICQA, ISQA, International Society for Quality and Accreditation. She's a fellow of Quality Leadership Program, Harvard Medical School, Boston, US, and also holds an international fellowship on health technology assessment, Anglia Ruskin University, UK. She has been continuously working for excellence in healthcare and has earned an honorary doctorate in hospital administration by Native American University. She has received numerous awards and recognitions for her contributions to the sector. Next, we have Dr. Pratap Chauhan, Director, Jiva Ayurveda, representing uh, alternative healthcare in India or the traditional healthcare practices. Dr. Pratap Chauhan is a well known Ayurvedic physician, author, public speaker, TV personality and pioneer of Ayurvedic telemedicine. He started the world's first Ayurvedic website, jiva.com in 1995, is the only Ayurvedic doctor to have won the prestigious World Summit Award given by UN. He's founder director of Jiva Ayurveda, which runs a network of 80 clinics all over India and the world's largest Ayurvedic telemedicine center, which consults 8,000 patients daily. Dr. Chauhan has traveled to over 40 countries and spread the knowledge of Ayurveda to common people. He has also established Jiva Ayurveda schools in Japan, France, Poland, and Lithuania, and is a lifetime Ashoka Fellow. He has also published the first ever big data analysis on Ayurveda. Next, we have Dr. Varendra Gurk, OSD to the Union Health Minister and President PGIMER, a radiologist by profession. Dr. Gurk is a serial innovator who has received multiple patents in the medical field, including Sensi, 
पोर्टेबल करेंसी सैनिटाइजिंग वॉलेट डिवाइस रक्षक जीएच स्क्रीनिंग कम डिस चैम्बर रीयूजेबल एयर प्यूरिफाइंग रेस्पिरेटर्स नॉकल मास्क फेस शील्ड फॉर नेसो लैरिंगोस्कोपी प्रोसीजर एंड डायग्नोस्टिक हेल्थ क्योर्स फॉर मॉनिटरिंग हेल्थ पैरामीटर्स He is also the founder president Society for Affordable Healthcare, a think tank of stakeholders active since 2016. It focuses on various aspects of patient care, including affordable medicines, health technologies, and is working for making healthcare affordable. Next, we have Mr. Satyaki Banerjee, COO Kiran X-Ray Trivitron, uh, Group CEO of Trivitron Healthcare. and ceo and he's uh, been building a world class medical imaging uh, business consisting of state of the art radiology equipment radiation protection products and accessories <coughs> uh, since joining rivitron in march 2015 he has spearheaded the development of a series of innovation driven products including digital c arms digital radiography digital mammography and ventilators over the past 6 years and therefore established trivitron as a leading radiology accessory and radiation protection company globally with exports to over 100 countries satyaki banerjee has uh, 25 years of experience in healthcare and pharmaceutical industry with extensive experience of managing pnl international business development strategic alliances research and development and operations He has also served as the vice president of international business and development at Panasia Biotech before joining the Trivitron family. So, to start with, I would like to invite Dr. Varidhar Kurt to give us a perspective on how uh, the pandemic has uh, catalyzed digital healthcare in India, how India is progressing in the field, and what benefits it can provide to other countries. Uh, Dr. Kurt, over to you, sir. Please. Um, thank you, Virat. uh my gratitude to the chairman ibpc shri shri kumar ji and the consul general of india shri aman ji for initiating and continuing such a valuable series so as virat ji has rightly mentioned that india is a big producer of the workforce along with that india is about to the largest network of state of the art high tech technology institutes comprising from the iits to the rcs and to the many technical universities we have proved our worth in the field of software and now india is progressing in hardware sector also medical devices is one of the important uh, vertical of the hardware in the last pandemic there was a great gap between the health industry and the software and the technical research institutes as far as india is concerned but during this pandemic a new dispensation of collaboration between the technicians of india has begun and the number of the startups and number of the innovations and the rising number of the patents filed during 3 years is one of the fact which will prove my claim and dr suchita markan is here along with us on the panel and she can also validate from the platform of the mdms they are almost supporting and observing all the developments in all parts of the india my counterparts in the uae is that ki why india can be a good partner to uae first of all the large technical base second the quality of the indian technicians third the language and expertise of the indian clinicians which we have proved in the northern america as well as the british uh, nhs almost every fourth or fifth doctor working in us or uk is indian nowadays and uh, if we'll see our own clinicians in india they are <clears throat> excelling in all the new field of the medicines as well as surgery 
so in my view we should must promote it seems there's a technical glitch uh, dr kar can you hear us okay uh, dr sajid uh, while he's uh, offline I, i would request you to we you know put up a question to your panelists there so that we can continue the session uh, as we know wellness uh... and our today's focus is more on wellness and healthcare so i'll start with dr parihar wellness is a very broad uh, term and uh, with care foldings coming into wellness and putting up an integrated cellness integrated uh, uh, clinic or an area or how do you see integrating wellness and the healthcare services together today and what is care foldings or care healthcare's look out on that Uh, a very good morning to all dignitaries and guests here and thank you dr sajid for the brief introduction you gave about me so that's a very valid question you put across and uh, whenever i go to talks my first question always is how do you understand what is health and wellness and the answer is is the same fundamentally yes i believe that superficially is the same but there's a a basic difference if you go to specificity health is a state of where you are or we can always say this person is healthy that means he is not suffering from any disease or an illness or a trauma but wellness is a concept where you achieve health so if i put it in a simple term health is the goal whereas wellness is a journey to achieve that goal so that's what i say this is what health and wellness is now i'll give an example uh, if you are not healthy you put in wellness you become healthy on the flip side if you are healthy and you still put wellness you stay healthy so it's a win win situation so which means the common denominator is wellness so if you put in wellness you are healthy now what is happening in the world today we have got two different models one is a pure healthcare and the other is wellness and they both are working independently of each other so what happens is we fall sick we rush to the hospital the doctor sees you he does some investigations he gives you a pill and tells you look either you take a pill or you change your lifestyle and you go back home and what do you do the first thing you pull out your smartphone from your pocket and start googling wellness and then look at videos from the youtube of how to do exercises how to do yoga and you do it for a few days and you achieve nothing and you come back after 6 months to the same doctor your disease has become even bad so again you get more pills and you are not happy so you take on pills and you add bills to you and this cycle goes and on till you reach the end on the other side we have wellness so people go to wellness uh take part in some activities of wellness lose a few kilos of weight come back they're very happy they've said i have ticked the check box i've been to a wellness resort i'm sorted and what happens couple of months down the line what you've achieved at that wellness resort is lost you go back to your own grind and you go back to the same situation and this is where we thought we should come in and bring both of these together and this is what i mean by integration so integrating the healthcare delivery model and integrating the wellness together so what we've done now as the first project at uh, india and calicut so we have a property which is around 30 acres of land and we brought in the best of all under one roof and we've seen uh, when we researched that if a person is exposed to uh, a sensual and a spiritual in a very good natural environment the health outcomes are fantastic and this is what we are providing there so once a person comes there he's consulted by a doctor from the modern medicine doctor from the alternative medicine could be from ayurveda tibetan medicine or chinese and then he's also consulted by a nutritionist because we feel that nutrition is the most important part of your healthy life and once everybody puts in their input a treatment protocol is created and then that person starts the journey of that treatment protocol so what we are trying to do there is not treat symptoms but try to go to the root find the root cause and try to treat the cause now here comes the second challenge so the person does that journey for maybe 7 21 days checks out and comes back to his own country and then what happens he continues the same advice for a few days 
or maybe a week, and then he's back to normal. So whatever is achieved and learned is again lost. And that is the second thing we wanted to address. So what we've thought, why not have a miniature version of this across the globe? And that is why we come up with a name of an urban centers. So our center in Calicut is known as Tula, which is a Sanskrit word for balance. So it balances your life, and then we create urban Tula. So we plan to create 100 Tulas across the globe. So for example, you come in from Dubai, you come to Tula, do all the tests, do the procedure, come back to Dubai, and then we have the same model here. You can engage yourself on a weekly basis, continue your journey, so that you are connected to wellness throughout life. And that is what I call integration of health. I thought, I thought I'm, I make it myself very clear, I suppose. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Back to you. Thank you, yeah, uh, thank you Dr. Sajid. Uh, Dr. Kurt, would you like to complete your remark quickly if you're back online? Dr. Kurt? It seems there's an issue still. Uh, I would now request uh, Dr. Suchita Markan to please uh, share her views, firstly, on the uh, Medical Device and Diagnostic Mission Secretariat, uh, what, it, uh, what it is aiming for, and how UAE can play a role in this mission uh, as a part of its larger partnership with India. Over to you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you, Virat, uh, for inviting me at this uh, uh, meeting. It's really a pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks IPPC also, and uh, the panel which I'm here. Thank you so much. So since this mission is pretty new to the uh, to the sector, so I'll just take a few slides, three, four slides to brief you about the MDMS, the Medical Device and Diagnostics Mission Secretariat, which I'm heading at ICMR headquarters. Uh, please allow me to share my screen. You have access, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you. Is it visible? Yes, ma'am. It's visible. Okay, fine. So basically, the we all know on on the board here know that the Indian medical device sector is highly import dependent, and uh, there are a lot of bits and pieces of works being done by different government de departments. But we talk to the stakeholders, and we thought there's lot a uh, lot of work which needs to be done by ICMR as well with having unique strengths in some areas particularly pertaining to clinical validation so a lot of efforts were happening around the ICMR also we have 27 in institutes across the country uh, but there was a need to uh, have something done in the mission mode to cater to this sector uh, so MDMS as uh, was launched here in ICMR headquarters in a mission mode to support and catalyze research development and indigenous manufacturing of robust and cost effective medical devices to strengthen healthcare sector in the country. We are just two year old uh, mission here. Uh, we are a division at ICMR headquarters, full fledged division. And we adopt a multi pronged approach because this sector needs a lot of support in the various sectors, uh, various subsectors, like it needs start startup handholding, market facilitation support, policy analysis, and advocacy. So, this is a multi pronged approach we follow here at ICMR to provide uh, support to this sector. And here in MDMS, we adopt both top-down and bottom-up approach. We know that there is a need to create a pipeline of innovative medical device technologies as well. Uh, so we adopt the top-down approach wherein we follow by design path. We have some schemes launched primarily at IITs. Uh, so here, uh, broadly in MDMS, what we are doing is that uh, a major gap which was seen in India was that doctors and engineers were not working together. Uh, and it is very much important when we look at the medtech sector. So we are trying to bring medicos and the engineers together. And we are primarily working with the IITs who already have some of the products lined with them. And we go and talk to them. We see if these products are in alignment with the national health missions. We provide them hand-holding support, work with them in mission mode. And we ultimately intend to bring those products to the market, primarily the government market uh, through public-private public partnerships. Then the role of industries will also come into play. Once these products are uh, developed to a level, they are validated by ICMR. So we have a lot of schemes under MDMS. Uh, and uh, the issue which we saw during the, when we look at the medical device technology development pathway, we see that the medtech product development typically starts with kind of funding. 
and then the scientists they start looking at what is the unmet need they have to uh, on which they have to work to develop a product it starts with identify then one goes to the technology development and validation the invent phase and ultimately implement phase where industry comes into picture for scale up and commercialization but what has happened in our country and primarily i would say it might be there in uh, in the entire medtech se sector when we look at globally that technologies are developed but at the level of proof of concept generally we have a bunch of proof of concepts waiting for going ahead with the validation the regulatory strategy not only for india but globally and how do do they cross this last miles keeping this in mind that lot of government agencies have worked lot of collaborators have worked to bring the technologies to this poc stage but lot there's there are very few success stories so government has to play a role in uh, creating more success stories so with this view in mind icmr having unique strengths in terms of validation of technologies helping do the animal studies preclinical and clinical studies working uh, doing the health technology assessment with the department of health research and then doing the operational feasibility of some of those products on the ground and if they are suitable then we can recommend those products for absorption in national health missions for large scale public procurement so these this is the valley of death the two three valleys of death on which mdms is focused icmr mdms is focused to provide hand holding support to the medtech entrepreneurs and the, and the industries and academia as well so we have lot of schemes lot of schemes uh, which are uh, which are uh, aimed to provide end to end support to the medtech entrepreneurs and the industry as well as uh, the institutes the uh, of eminence national importance as of now and we are very young but uh, quite a team of motivated uh, professionals so here i wanted to bring on board after having this brief introduction on mdms i just wanted to have a brief discussion on the key areas wherein uh, india and us uh, india and ue have good synergies uh, so i'll just stop sharing my screen and uh, there are two three areas which typically come into our mind is that uh, icmr has a set a setup uh institution nationwide we have a nationwide network of uh, sites by virtue of which we can have the products independently validated through our network uh, we have pan india 50 such centers across the country and uh, we have uh, we have the technical expertise also in doing that so we are we are here to help the industry do the clinical validation and uh, we all know that when we have to look at the large animal studies china is the hub but now looking at the gap that we need to increase those centers we have also set up large animal house facility uh, the primate studies can only happen in icmr institute national institute of virology we have that in house strengths so uh, we propose and we will be very happy to extend those services uh, of the frugal health is the major issue which uh, everybody is trying to Uh, enter into when it comes to developed countries so the advantage of india is uh, with icmr on board is that we can develop frugal medical device technologies which are very robust as well they have crossed all the pathways of regulatory uh, standards uh, my colleague here uh, pralok and others would also appreciate uh, satyagi that uh, that's the advantage which india offers and we will be happy to provide that kind of a support to the uae startups or the, our companies who who cross those uh, milestones they can be referred to uae uh, for providing them the global access as they mentioned providing them hand holding support uh, the, these are two three areas and uh, my uh, colleague on the dais uh, has already talked about the fdi the uh, in the medtech and healthcare sector the fdi policies are very liberal we have 100% fdi here so we also welcome you all to come and set up uh, make it, uh, the manufacturing facilities here because we our government is strongly pushing the make in india initiative for the medtech sector and we'll be very happy to support in that endeavor as well uh, this is all from my side thank you thank you so much ma'am it's a very very positive mission and uh, wish you all the best for your work uh, going forward uh, over to you dr sajid quality care is all what we look at and uh, quality is mostly compromised when we uh, is always compromised when we look at uh, in terms of profits and everything so my next question to dr malti who has a great experience in maintaining this quality care and operations what is value based care and how important it is to balance this structure of maintaining quality and providing the best health care and maintaining the investors happy 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. And at the outset, thank you very much for uh, getting me an opportunity to meet the dignitaries over here and have an opportunity of a panel discussion. I bring greetings from Astadium Healthcare. Um, a beautiful question which talks about value-based care. What is a patient looking for? We are at this point in time talking about healthcare. What is it that we can do best as healthcare providers and in this process have excellent collaborations across the geographies, but all of these has to culminate for that one person who is probably writhing in pain in beds of the hospital, does he deserve the best? I think that is a purpose of all this agreements and that we go for because we are trying to make sure give, we give best to this person who needs good health. Whether it is good health or wellness, what is it that we can do for them and that we define as value-based care. Now, what is this value-based care? Simple. It just means, are we patient-centric? Whether it is the provision of the quality of care whether it is from the devices that he uses or it is going to be any product that you give him, the services you give. He talked about a lot about the medical devices and so on and so forth. I think all of this is because we are patient-centric. That's the first thing. And it's very clear when we have such meetings where we have experienced people, dignitaries, domain experts coming together, I think that's whole goal is to provide value-based care. Now, when I say value-based care or patient-centric care, it is imperative in today's world. Any healthcare provider will be successful if they are able to give this value-based what the patient is looking for. What is he looking for? Am I getting the care for what I'm paying for it? And that means it is a unit cost to our patients. So anything that we do, we have to ensure that he gets the value. And that we say, what is value-based care? The best outcome. No longer is the dictum that we talk about outcomes being measured by the provider. Quality is all about what the receiver believes and not the provider. And that means who has the right to decide about your care, the receiver, and who is your receiver? The patient. The patient has to say, wow, that was the best outcome. So far, there has been definitely a talking about patient outcomes and every hospital or every medical center, every healthcare provider says, my outcomes are fantastic. But now it's important for the patients to say that was an excellent outcome. I am satisfied with the care that you provide. I am satisfied for the value that you have given. So there is a paradigm shift where patients come out and tell you, and therefore we have moved into totally of measuring, not from the hospital side, we measure from the patient side, which is what is called as the patient related outcome measures. It's called PROM. It is patient-related experience measures, which is PREM. It is your PROM and PREM that you must be able to put on your website or elsewhere and say, this is what my patient has to say. And then that patient says, wow, other patients have got this good care. Otherwise, it's always easy for the healthcare provider to say, I have given you the best. And therefore, everything that needs to be done and how to deliver comes in with this excellent agreements that we come in because what does it aim at? From the morning that we have heard when we had Dr. Avan Puri's excellency talking or whether it was Dr. Suresh Nair talking, it was all about what do we give best to the patients? This agreement finally, whether it is in every field that we talk about is all aiming at what can we give to the patients by the healthcare industry. I think that's the theme of this entire thing. That means the patient and the provider start sharing. It is participative decision. 
gone are the days where the doctor just decides, this is your treatment, please go ahead with it. An era has come where the patient says, let me be a part of the decision-making process. It's become extremely integrated interactive where you can give best to the patients and then finally he says that this is a care that has been given so friends i'd just like to say the value based care how do i finally is it easier said than done no it is easily possible goal is achievable all we need to do a little restructuring of the framework what do we mean by restructuring of the framework whether it is the best manpower that we have, whether it is the best technology that you can provide. All of this is what we need to work on and relook at, is this going to add value to my patients? And when that answer is yes, every collaboration will be a success story because whether it is the farmer, it means that you have sharing the best ideas between India and the UAE beautifully put up when we said we can have the, the entire uh, gamut of pharmacy is available in India. And now we have joining hands to say, can we provide maybe at a much lesser cost to the same person? And that is value-based care. Whether it is your technology where you come here and you set up the best minds work together. And what is all this for? Once again, to that patient, who's writhing in pain in the beds of the hospital. And that's what I say is value-based care. The patient decides you have given the worth for the money that I spend. Therefore, the shift has been that you pay your service providers, your doctors, not just in terms of the treatment, but you pay him in terms of the quality outcome of the services, which is decided by the patient. The patient decides that was a great outcome and the consultant therefore goes in for his payment, which moves the entire needle shifting. Patient decides and therefore you give the best services and the doctors go on naturally to making sure the services are what the patient is looking for. So friends, I believe the need, the error is into it. And all of us as healthcare providers have one focus, and that is the provision of value-based care. Thank you very much. Very back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to now come to Dr. Upasna. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I would like to know your views on... Uh, the new paradigm of Indian healthcare with the notable initiatives like Heal in India and Heal by India and how do you see the prospects with this agreement with the UAE for the Indian healthcare sector? Over to you, ma'am. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, uh, Virat. And thank you, organizer, for giving me this opportunity. <clears throat> As I am part of Service Export Promotion Council also, so I can say that it's a very good initiative because uh, I have met some delegation from UAE a few days before they came to India just to look for good, uh, you know, good manpower and they were offering us if we can go there or if they are coming to India, how we can, you know, give best care to their patients and something like that. So with the, these things, I can say that actually India has a tremendous uh, possibility to provide good or I should say best quality care to everyone in India, as well as we have young generation who are trained manpower. So they can go to different countries, like they can go to UAE and they can provide uh, like our nurses are already going to UAE or our uh, doctors are uh, providing services. And as our prime minister wants to uh, develop this uh, medical value travel in many folds. So uh, because India is providing not only uh, modern science, but uh, same time India is providing different kind of uh, uh, as uh, Yunani, homeopathy, Ayurveda and uh, other medicines. So India is the best destination to come for uh, taking such uh, facilities as well as 
if something is not somebody cannot come so we can provide our services to other countries uh, i am very lucky that i am part of this uh, accreditation body of uae and uh, i am on their board for their uh, they are developing their uh, policies and their standards and they are doing uh, such great job for accreditation in uae so then i can see that uh, ua is actually focusing on healthcare and they are very eager to provide best quality care to their patients and when i talk about uh, quality care of patients basically as my uh, dear friend um, dr malti who is good friend of mine also she was talking about that now patients voice is very important so you know if you are providing good care so what is more important a uh, patient outcome uh, you know written by doc uh, hospital is important but same time what patient is thinking about you that is very much important and in india if you see somebody is coming for treatment we are not only treating him as a patient rather we are providing him just uh, uh, best care with very uh, personal touch as he is our guest because india has a policy of atithi devo bhava so we have that culture so because of this uh, if you ask me india is the best place for quality care with different segment of uh, you know medical health not only modern science with the help of ayurveda and other things same time if if we talk about uh, pharmacy uh, everybody has seen india that we were able to you know develop a vaccine in a very short period of, period of time so we have the best brain uh, best scientist in india who are providing different kind of things and my colleague who is sitting there and she was presenting presentation about devices so you know india is a uh, coming up with very big ideas with new things new technology so i think and ua is uh, can provide us many uh, you know many kind of uh, opportunities so we can work together and this sepa is a very good opportunity for both the countries and i think if we will work together and we can provide our you know talent to them and uh, uh, if their patients are coming to india so in both the situation it's a win win situation for both countries as well as individuals individuals are also happy that is why lots of indians are working in uae and they are providing their services in form of doctor nurses technicians and physiotherapists in different ways same time lots of patients coming from uae but uh, unfortunately we are not getting that that uh, that much uh, you know bunch of patients from uae because uh, we were not thinking about that kind of uh, you know comfortable facilities for them and that is why they were uh, going to japan but now uh, india is uh, making different kind of facilities especially for the ua uh, patients so that whatever they want if he, they want a uh, separate floor from the, for them or something like that whatever uh, their requirement we are ready to fulfill that to provide them best quality healthcare with their uh, personal needs to fulfill their personal needs so with these words i think india and uae are actually now become very close friends and uh, we are uh, knowing each other better than before and now we are trying to uh, shake hands and trying to provide best care for the, both the citizens of uae and india thank you virat thank you so much ma'am for your remarks uh, dr sajid over to you for your question to your panelists anjay you have been in the uae for almost for more than two or three decades and you have seen the different changes in healthcare sector which has improved and this pandemic has shown us a lot of changes in the healthcare services how we provide it and uh, how we have maintained cost and especially your contribution during the pandemics have been marvelous can you just tell us about the pre the healthcare scenario pre covid and post covid in uae hello hello yeah uh, thank you very much <clears throat> yeah it's uh, almost 35 years i have been providing healthcare services through right health 
and before that it was government of dubai i was working with <laughs> well the world will be known now uh, bc and ad continues bc will be before corona ad will be replaced by after corona that is ac things have changed a lot initially uh, the healthcare in this country was very difficult to access it was uh, uh, geographically not distributed well on but coming back to this uh, present time post corona everybody has got an access to healthcare a quality healthcare a value healthcare which is very important the government has uh, definitely put an uh, into action the insurance which has helped people all around the uh, uae to get an affordable healthcare as well as a quality healthcare <clears throat> but still today if you go uh, and see patients almost 20% of the patients over here are still uninsured or they don't have access to insurance so what happens with this 20% of the patients <clears throat> they have to pay their own healthcare cost healthcare cost in this part of the world is very exorbitant where comes the role of right health we believe in provide a quality health care at a affordable cost and easily accessible talking about the government they have been quite generous in uh, providing the best of the health care during the corona time it was a quick response which created huge hospitals huge camps uh, they had partnered with the private so it was a public private partnership in prevention in diagnosis in treatment as well as vaccination where all of us were involved and uh, this country has put forward as an example to the world that whether it is pandemic endemic if things work in the right direction collectively with contribution from both the private and public the results are wonderful and that's what we have seen we as uh, providers we had huge number of patients starting off with almost 4 to 5000 patients daily coming to our camps to be treated for the corona the amount of pressure that we had on the providers was great but still the whole private sector as well as the government sector was put into action without any question as the government has provided an excellent health care to each and everybody here you compare with west if you want to see a doctor it takes time here you can walk into the clinic and get a doctor's advice few weeks back i was in us i was surprised one of my friend's daughter had a pneumonia 6 years old her specialist opinion for the pediatrician was after 3 weeks i imagine if you have an uh, patient who is sick needs appointment and you are going to get a treatment done after 6 weeks we are very fortunate in this part of the world that we can walk into the specialist treatment done and walk away with with a healthy life so things have changed post corona more and more emphasis has been put into what is called prevention nobody was thinking of prevention but today everybody has understood those who were healthy survived the better so the concept of prevention has come in the post corona time and the industry has understood it is cheaper to prevent than to treat any case now we have cases uh, we have conditions where we call preventive cardiology we have preventive endocrinology and preventive diabetes we have preventive gynecology and all these things will be coming up where a part of it will be wellness a part of through the health schemes where ultimately a healthy person has a better chance of survival whether it is endemic or pandemic thank you very much thank you dr sanjay and i think we all have to learn a lot from your experience and services offered to the uae 
thank you. Back to you. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Sajid. Uh, indeed, this is a very valid point. Uh, focus on prevention, focus on wellness. Uh, we should always have been like that, but it seems the pandemic compelled us to become like this. Uh, but uh, on that, uh, in that context, it's very relevant that I would like to now call Dr. Pratap Chauhan to speak about uh, how alternate Indian traditional Ayurvedic practices or in general, you know, alternate healthcare have been promoting holistic, uh, you know, wellness and how the industry has grown and particularly post pandemic. What has your experience been, sir? Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. And I am very happy to be a part of this esteemed panel. And um, my job has been, uh, you know, made easy by the panelists from the way already because they have, they have been, all the three panelists have been emphasizing on wellness. Uh, of course, the word wellness is very foggy. It, it still needs to be understood in details what it actually means. And when we will really try to understand what wellness is all about, this is... Uh, I, I can say in word one word is that this is all what is mentioned in Ayurveda, whether it is uh, preventive care, which is a very, very uh, important part of Ayurveda, which the world has definitely realized post pandemic and during the pandemic, especially, you know, not only in India, all over the world, people have realized what is the power of uh, prevention by taking even just if you have some ginger or black pepper or something in your kitchen, <laughs> Of course, in India, people were taking a lot of Ayurvedic herbs. But, you know, I think there is still a need to dive deeper and understand what exactly is this holistic health care is. It's not just, you know, when you say wellness, what comes into your mind is you may be some resort on the beach or, you know, some something in Himalaya, getting some Ayurvedic massage or maybe doing some meditation but, you know, uh, for your information, and I would like to really, uh, you know, draw your attention, all the specialists here from modern medicine, that Ayurveda in itself is a very, very, you know, comprehensive medical science. You know, it's been there for thousands of years. Uh, the, word, the word health described in Ayurveda, which in Sanskrit is called swastha. You now, the word swastha itself, you know, involves not just treating the diseases, it it's involves prevention. It involves, you know, what we call uh, psychological care, emotional care, social health, spiritual health. This is all involved in that. And also, you know, if I talk in terms of like simple things, when we talk even about prevention, there is something which is called primal care in Ayurveda. So right from the time of conception, pregnancy care is a, is a huge thing, you know. Now, you know, if you look at the children, the kind of uh, behavior problems they're having. Children like five, last week I got a patient from US, four years old, has been diagnosed with ADD and I, we get so much such, such patients like autistic children. So we have to go to the root cause of the problem. And I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Parihar, Dr. Maitri and uh, the other panelist, uh, Dr. Sanjay, you have been talking about what is, uh, you know, uh, Care, care with love, which is called, you know, in our, in our language, we call it sadbhav. So anyway, so what I want to just mention here is that uh, what we have been doing for last 15 years uh, specifically is creating protocols. And when it comes to treatment uh, in Ayurveda, for example, which is now considered only like some, some kind of a massage in Kerala, it's not like that. We have been receiving patients uh, almost like from 35 countries. And you will be very happy to know that the, the patients that we receive in Ayurveda are not coming from Africa or from, you know, even uh, the third world countries. They all come from USA, UK, Japan, Australia, and people suffering from like neurological disorders, autoimmune diseases, all the so-called, of course, lifestyle disease. When it comes to lifestyle disease, that's a very big thing. But even chronic degenerative diseases, skin problems, rheumatoid arthritis, all uh, like uh, kidney problems, you know, which is becoming a big issue. Oncology is a big thing. So we are doing quite well. And uh, as I mentioned that when it comes to like uh, people asking, what, how do you do it or what you do it? Most people are looking for like, okay, what evidence you have? But I think now we have to move into what is called the outcome-based result. You know? So we have a database of around uh, 2 million patients. 
and that's what we did. We published big data analysis on that, and amazing results were found in that. That how you know considering the comorbidities or the age age wise sections. So uh, I think the opportunity is great, and especially because we are talking today about how we can work together with UAE. I believe that UAE is uh, itself is like a central point where the world is attracted for so many things. So one thing is, of course, we can set up centers there. Uh, the challenge will be, the first challenge, which I always say is that the, the two, two parties need to come together. We need to understand each other. It's been a challenge. Of course, we have been doing quite a few projects now. We are, we are working with one, we call it a Swastha project with uh, Japanese medical doctors. And it's a very interesting project I would like to mention is that uh, the patients which they cannot you know do much of they will give these patients to us we do their ayurvedic consultation ayurvedic diagnosis we give them the medicines and the modern monitoring is done by them everything is monitored through modern technology and whatever the test they do and of course we work together and i really like the idea of dr ravi parihar which uh, which they are doing in kalikat i think this is the future of ayurveda there is a great opportunity, but let me just, um, just uh, reiterate on this point and please try to understand that Ayurveda or traditional medicine is not unscientific. It is not just a massage or just kind of a wellness thing. It's more than that, especially the mental health where the world is really suffering today the, in the mental health. We have nothing much to offer. There's a lot of mindfulness happening around, which is just our meditation. So I think we need to work together, create joint protocols, which are scientifically, you know, scientifically, which people can understand what we're trying to do. And I see that there is a great future in this collaboration of UAE and India, and we will be very happy to work together. Of course, there are some challenges which um, um, Viratji, your party and other the government people are working very hard. You know, I have been a part of a, quite a few discussions and uh, we, we are very happy that the the prime minister especially our prime minister is so interested to to really push this sector and if you look at if you talk about the growth there is a tremendous growth in 2014 ayurveda or ayush business was around 300 billion it's reached out to 18 18 billion in the current year and expected to be uh, ending like 23 billion something in the current financial year and the growth uh, is is huge that we see because after the pandemic people have realized that we need to go back to our roots we need to find out what is the root cause of our problem is the problem in our lifestyle is the problem in our food is the problem in our mind is it in our relations and that's where ayurveda steps in you know Ayurveda, you know, the word Ayurveda itself is a Veda of Ayur. And Ayur is nothing but a combination of body, mind, senses and soul. So this, this knowledge, I, I, I often call it say, instruction manual for the human system. So if you have any problem in this system, you have to look into the manual. And the solutions are very natural, which the whole world is moving towards natural, organic and uh, people are moving towards that. So uh, I would like to just thank you again for inviting me to this, uh, this platform. And uh, I would also like to invite people, you know, to please come, come and discuss things, what the work which we have done in last, you know, almost 30 years, we are very happy to share with all of you. And uh, of course, the goal is to provide a healthcare, which is when we say healthcare, it is not only just disease care, you know, we're also talking here about people who are healthy and how they can rejuvenate, how they can, you know, maintain their health. So it should be definitely affordable. It should be, you know, uh, quality health care. And of course, it should be a care which provides love and compassion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, really appreciate all the invaluable work you're doing. Uh, I would like to now request Mr. Satyaki Banerjee to please... Uh, Share his views on the medical devices sector um, and uh, what opportunities do you see with UAE in this sector? Over to you, sir. Thank you, Virat. 
Uh, first of all, a very good morning to all the dignitaries and the guests who are joining this very important panel discussion. I like the comment of uh, Dr. Sanjay. Uh, he mentioned uh, BC and AD uh, before COVID and uh, say after COVID. And uh, I was just thinking of another uh, perspective to that. And what we have seen is uh, the BC is uh, the best during the time of crisis. We, we have seen the entire healthcare industry across the world working together. Medical device companies, manufacturers, they have done something which has, which has uh, no uh, you know, analogy in the past. Uh, say for example, India, Indian manufacturers who never made ventilators, uh, we were able to develop ventilators within a very short uh, span of time. And uh, we have been able to uh, supply uh, more than 100,000 ventilators to various uh, institutions across the country. The same is the case with uh, you know, the promptness and uh, the kind of agility uh, the entire industry demonstrated while developing the COVID vaccine, running RT-PCR uh, you know, programs, kits across uh, the world. So this is what we have demonstrated, the best at the time of crisis. And uh, I was also thinking of what could be the right analogy for AD and uh, post-COVID. And I came up uh, with this phrase called action with determination. And probably uh, that would, uh, that, that's what we are seeing uh, during this conversation today. So everyone is talking about very tangible action and uh, a clear uh, determined uh, pathway to achieve those endpoints. With, with, with this uh, preamble, I'd like to you know, give a very quick recap of where the healthcare industry is at this moment, the medical device industry in India. So as of 2020, the medical device industry in India, the market was estimated to be US dollar 12 billion, and uh, which is growing at a CAGR of 15% every year, which is 2.5 times the global growth rate. So uh, the medical device India is, uh, I mean, the market in India is booming. And India is probably the fourth largest uh, Asian medical device market after Japan, China, South Korea. And we are amongst the top 20 medical device uh, manufacturing uh, markets globally. And uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, a very rapid growth rate, even in the amount of manufacturing, which is happening in this country. Uh, a case in point here is the amount of exports which are happening out of India. So export of medical devices from India, it stood at uh, US dollar 2.53 billion in 2021, and uh, which is expected to grow up to $10 billion by 2025. And what are the things that are changing in India? What are the uh, dynamics uh, uh, you know, which are being supported by the government and the way the industry is gearing up to achieve this huge growth. We are talking of uh, almost almost a fourfold growth uh, over the next uh, four years. So uh, I like to highlight some of the programs which has been rolled out by the government of India to support manufacturing of world standard uh, products in India. One is the production linked uh, incentive scheme. So the government has rolled out the PLI scheme, uh, which incentivizes manufacturers. Uh, who are getting into the manufacturing of very complex medical devices. A case in point here is I represent Trivitron Healthcare. And uh, we have been a major radiology player making X-rays, CRMs, uh, CT scanners, uh, mammography system. But with the scheme and the motivation from the government, we are getting into the manufacturing of very complex products like a CT scanner, an MRI, a cath lab. And that's going to be uh, the, the first time uh, such a thing is happening in India. The second major thing that is happening is uh, we, we are trying to create an ecosystem where companies, they can collaborate with each other. And this is happening through the development of medical device park. A classic case in point is what we see at Andhra Pradesh MedTech Zone. It has become a, a, a great example of what a good MedTech park should be like, where we have uh, all the ancillary manufacturing units at the same place, uh, testing labs, regulatory uh, setups, everything happening there. And uh, with such medtech parks coming up uh, almost all across India, we, we, we see a very rapid growth uh, in the medical device manufacturing, which is happening in this country. But if I have to highlight one of the most important things and a very important decision taken by the government is the harmonization of the regulatory standards. The regulatory standards in India is at this moment completely harmonized with, with what is expected in European Union, and in the US and all the developed countries. It has become mandatory for all manufacturers to have an ISO 13485 compliance, 
And that's a prerequisite even, the, even before they could apply for a pre-marketing authorization, uh, even for India. And uh, the CDSCO, they have adopted the MDR and the IVDR 2017 standards, which are based on the European uh, MDR and IVDR standards. And, and that is creating an ecosystem, a kind of a, a cognizance to quality and a high standard of manufacturing, which makes the products being manufactured in India almost at par with those being made uh, in European Union or by the, the established manufacturers in North America and in Japan. And, and that is where we are seeing uh, a, a major change in the way we are doing the uh, manufacturing here in this country. And that's opening up a lot of avenues for exports. Uh, Trivitron Healthcare, uh, you know, as an organization, we also have uh, the advantage of understanding the ecosystem uh, in UAE because we run a, a distribution setup, uh, a subsidiary company we have in UAE. And we have a very good understanding of the requirements uh, from a UAE healthcare perspective. And uh, one of the things that I would propose and uh, support from our counterparts in UAE is we have seen that generally uh, there is a very high level of acceptance of products coming from the so-called developed nations uh, uh, in, in Europe and uh, in North America. But uh, I would like to uh, reiterate this point and uh, uh, confirm that the products that we are making in India is almost at the same level of standards. And we would be very happy to see a, a more wider acceptance of these products manufactured by uh, Indian uh, you know, companies uh, in the UAE and also uh, to the larger segment of GCC and uh, the MENA region. Another point which I would like to, uh, uh, you know, highlight here is the the, the current uh, scenario is uh, a lot of organizations uh, which are of uh, Indian origins they are operating there in UAE. Uh, uh, someone rightly pointed out that most of the doctors who are working in the healthcare setup in UAE and uh, GCC they are of Indian origin and and they have a fairly good understanding of the products uh, which are being made here in India. And uh, uh, because they have been trained in uh, me medical institutes in the country, they have used, they are conversant with those products. And uh, with the whole thing coming together, we can create a very strong collaborative ecosystem uh, between India and UAE. And as a major Indian manufacturer, uh, we have been over the past few years exploring the possibility of uh, starting a manufacturing unit in UAE where we would be able to cater to the demands of uh, the local market in a far more efficient and effective manner. And uh, I, th I think the same uh, sentiment is being shared by most of the manufacturers, at least the major manufacturers in this country. We are very keen on expanding our operations in UAE, understanding uh, the, the, the requirements of the market and setting up and expanding our distribution and marketing, as well as manufacturing operations uh, in that segment. With this, I would like to conclude uh, uh, my part here. Thank you, Virat. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so that's uh, the initial remarks of all our panelists. Uh, uh, we have gone through that first round. Uh, I would now like to request Dr. Sajid to take up audience questions, if possible, from the UAE side. And from India, I request anybody having any queries to please share them in the chat box. Over to you, Dr. Sajid. Hi, good, after, good morning, everyone. And I think it has been a very interesting, my name is Dilip Sinha, and I was been associated with Indian Business Council besides uh, working uh, in industry. Uh, I have, I mean, it's been very interesting, especially on the wellness. Uh, I was at Chalambra on the inauguration when the Optula brand unveiling with my wife, and it was very interesting concept. Uh, visited Matre Hospital also and um, saw the correlation between the two. One question to the entire panel, and anyone can answer that, you know, the correlation between the commercial outcome that healthcare providers expect to the outcome of the uh, patient's health, what the patient accepts, uh, the correlation or the conflict between the two, uh, which uh, might uh, create problems, especially in the private uh, hospitals and private care providers. 
Did you get my question or no? Okay. So there is a commercial aspect, which we all know that everybody is there for profitability, but many times that conflicts uh, or comes in the way of proper care to the patients or maybe over care provided and because of the commercial expectations. So how do we take care or ensure that uh, commercial aspect do not come in the way of proper health uh, uh, care provided uh, to the patients, uh, especially by the private hospitals or private care providers? I think Dr. Oila. See, basically, the healthcare has converted into an industry now, which used to be a noble profession years before, <clears throat> has now become a corporate based industry. <clears throat> and as the invest as an investor, somebody is investing into healthcare, uh, very few people have a end goal of doing a charity but most of them have got an end goal of converting into profits now how to balance it is a very important thing and the balancing act has to be done by those people who are invested into that industry we have on one side uh, an industry people who force upon the doctors to write particular medicine, particular test, particular operations. On the other hand, we have a set of doctors who are being given free hand that the patient is the patient satisfaction and patient's improvement care is the goal. Now, ultimately, the employer or the investor has to decide upon this. So when it comes to uh, the treatment of a patient, still there are people like us who are into this industry, who do take care of uh, the patient. I won't say I'm doing charity, but my business model is totally different, which has been copied by most of the universities in the world. I believe in giving the best of the services at the most affordable cost, my profit margins are very, very minimal, but the volume, what we do is very high and that's how we make the money. If you have an just opposite way that you have one patient giving you thousands and thousands of dirhams of profit, it doesn't work. Especially post Corona with the financial changes in the society and the economic upturn in the world, the best approach to healthcare will be those who can minimize the profit, but improve the volumes. I think that will be a great answer to, because everybody wants profit. Today, if I don't declare profit, the people who are invested in my industry will be blaming me. So profits are there, but this will be an ethical way of doing a profit. Then also giving a good health care to the patients. Can I just add on to what you just said? So what we think is, uh, he's talked about having more volumes as, per, as compared to one single patient. Oh, I mean, more of that. What I think is the delivery model has to now change. At this moment, my delivery model is totally treating people. So it is more based on you fall sick, you come to the hospital, we treat you, we make money. Now, what I propose and what I think is the world has to go towards prevention. I want more people that, that in that way, it follows his model that we'll have everybody coming to your center for prevention. So do a preventive medicine so they do not fall sick. And what on the economic front, you make money because you have everybody attached to your organization coming in for preventive health checkup. We do things so that you do not fall sick. It also relieves the burden of the government on providing services. Uh, I'm just giving you a small, you know, India spends around uh, $35 billion a year only on managing these complications of obesity. Imagine if you prevent those con uh, conditions, which is because of obesity, you save that $35 billion, which is not a small amount, it's 1% of the total GDP of the country. So that's what I'm saying. So the model has now to change. And that's how it balances between uh, your question, what you said of between the economics and uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, provi the provider who gets the service. Thank you. 
Good. Uh, may I come in for a minute? Yeah, Dr. Uh, Sajid. Uh, uh, what is very important is, is, I agree with both my colleagues, one who talked about volume increase and another who went into preventive. I add to that and compliment by saying the care delivery model has changed and it is COVID which has taught us how to change. Simple enough, most of the healthcare providers, unlike other industries, whether it was IT and others, which came to a slum, one of the industries which still progressed was healthcare. What was the reason? Patients were not coming to the hospitals, but still hospitals were doing well. So what was the reason for the success? The hospitals took the care to the patients. That's all changed. And what did it mean? You moved on to teleconsults. You still had to provide people will fall sick. That's why they always say healthcare will always be a boom because people will fall sick. And but the delivery model was you moved into teleconsult because you realized chronic patients dearly don't have to come to the hospital. You can get and take care of them and prompt and supplement them by apps, which says it is time for you to get your HbA1c done. Earlier, they used to come to the hospital and all the doctor would say is, good, you're doing well. Can you go and get these tests done? Does he have to come to the hospital just to find out from a doctor, I need to get it done? All he does now is a prompt on the app, which says it's time for you for your HbA1c. It's time for you get your diabetic check done for your eyes. That's it. He doesn't come. So what did it mean? Beds were available in the hospital for acute care. You could take care of critical patients, which probably sometimes because of chronic patients occupying the beds, you were sending them away. So this is the healthcare delivery model we changed. And the way it changed was technology came into force. And therefore, hospitals still made the business. It was not that it changed the model and you still continue with type of ethical practice, take care of preventive health on one side, take care of the volumes because everything became online to them and we shifted to home care. You are sick, you don't have to come. In fact, in case you come, you're going to fall sicker. So home care became the need of the art. I think that's the delivery model which keeps them going and doing business the ethical way. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I have a question. Um, hi, I'm Anamika and I have worked on stress response genes. We are all talking of wellness, prevention, good lifestyle. Are we doing, since we are in the center of uh, policymakers and all trade people and those in the industry, are we doing anything to um, uh, at the policymakers level so that the lifestyle of people improves? For example, before COVID, after COVID, BC or AC stress remains the same. In fact, it's got worse, I guess, with trying to reach the economic goals, trying to reach all this. I will um, also add one thing now that there is enough evidence and it's going rapidly increasing that molecular biology at the uh, modern science is giving support to Dr. Chauhan said that how wellness, whether it's meditation, yoga, how we can switch on our good genes by just uh, doing a regular stretch of meditation yoga and how the metabolic processes, which we leads to chronic diseases, which is related to lifestyle, and we can rewrite our script of health using that. So is policymakers, my basic question is, since that is the base, and since it's, as Dr. Ravi said, it's a huge economic burden on any country for the chronic diseases, at the policy level, are we doing anything to change the lifestyle of people, like shut off the computers at X and go home, have a good lifestyle, exercise regularly. Dubai is trying to, that November we have the fitness. So similarly food, all the good foods are so expensive. You go for organic, it's expensive. So that's where we need to fill the gap, I believe. And that can only happen with policymakers. Thank you. Anybody wants to take it? So I, I, I can come in, please. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, I'm till sorry. today, no insurance was willing to look at wellness as a part of your policy. Post-COVID, 
with the experience what we got all insurance are trying to add up wellness prevention as a part of a policy and in fact we are into discussion with some of the insurance companies where we will be getting a score on them that if you improve your score uh, score during the period of your policy that for example if your score was 10 which was bad and you come to score 5 which was good the uh, the premium of the policy will be based on that so you improve your wellness you improve your health so as a insurer the cost of my treating you reduces and you get the point back this is getting implemented but it's going to take time see once once the things are into the policy a lot of people will go to wellness i think most of the policies now do add mental health as an amount given to them in their premiums you know to be paid off and that will say and it could be anything alternative medicine mental health or any other things and insurance payouts are also changing it is not on uh, treatment based but on outcome basis so they will only pay the doctor if there is a good outcome so that doctors educating the patients will change like doctor should not just advise him on giving a medicine there is a lot of other benefits he has to talk weight reduction mental health and that's the outcome what we will see and that's when the insurance will pay off to the doctors so it is changing especially in the uae government a lot of policies a lot of insurance meetings are happening now and we'll have to see some changes by next year yes can i can i come in please yeah please Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. So I think it's a very nice question. And if we really want to solve this problem of stress, we have to start very early. You know, the healthcare is not an issue of like when person becomes sick. Uh, we actually in Jiva we say it's from womb to tomb. You know, it's it's a complete uh, cycle. And uh, as far as the policy, I think now in India they have uh, this new edu national education policy because it has to start in the schools. You know, if you want to really uh, make the ha good habits, it has to start from the childhood. Of course, in Jiva, we already have a school which we are running for uh, last 30 years. We call it now Ayur School. And in this school, you will see that children, they are taught about what is their body constitution. We also involve the parents and the parents are also taught. They are also educated. Then every child is doing a small introspection. We call it Swadhyay because they have to also work on their psychological behavior problems, you know. And then in addition to that, there is a program which is called daily routine program. What they have to do when they wake up, drink water and simple Ayurvedic Dhinacharya, we call it. So this Ayur school program, and then we have a program for the corporates. It's called Ayur Corp where we are going into the corporate people because that's where the lot of stress is being you know experienced by the people there so we have some some we have designed some programs for the corporate people also in fact the ayush ministry uh, had run this uh, yoga break program very interesting program in all the corporates i was a part of one of the seminars also that every corporate should have some break where they can do little stretching breathing exercises so i think in india the, the, the ministry is definitely working towards this goal because the national education policy, they also have certain programs where they're changing the games children should play. They should uh, reduce the digital time. And of course, there is a, like something called the bag-free school where you don't have to carry your books, do some activities. So some things are going on. And uh, I, I believe that uh, in, in coming time, this, this will have to be done otherwise the stress is going to take take a big toll on on people's health thank you sir thank you so much uh, dr sajid i'll just request one intervention uh, dr roda had some comment to make in the previous question over to you ma'am yeah actually uh, i was just uh, listening that question and over treatment so i just want to tell you that uh, it 
you cannot run hospital industry as a business model. If you are running a hospital, you should have some empathy, some sympathy and some human touch for the patients. So, and hospital industry is actually working on, uh, you know, word of mouth and faith. So, uh, I don't think that if there must be some black sheep in the industry and they can create such kind of, uh, you know, work. But uh, overall, I can say that hospitals are the place where people are coming with the faith. And in my hospital, we are not providing any kind of, uh, you know, target to the doctors. What we believe that whatever is required for a patient, we need to do only that kind of investigation or that kind of sur surgery and all. So uh, I think your patient is your uh, brand ambassador and he is sending you more patients. So one should not think it's high time to uh, change our perception about hospitals, that hospitals are doing uh, you know, unnecessary testing or unnecessary procedures. So actually, I 100% believe in this and my, uh, my hospital's image, Ashoda Super Specialty Hospital is known for their ethical work. And I believe all those who are successful running a hospital, they must be following these norms that whatever is required, you have to do that only. Thanks. Ma'am, uh, over to you, Dr. Sajid. Thank you, Viraji. With this, we have come to the end of the discussion. We would like to thank the Trade Promotion Council of India and Council General of India for their support. We would like to thank you all for taking time out. I may now request the Chairman IBPC, Suresh Kumarji, to please join us on the head table for a group photograph. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see you very soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, hey, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Be the pleasure. Bye -bye. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.